Okay, I think we can start. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, it's good that there's still some people on Friday afternoon who are interested in doing some hands-on data analysis stuff. So it's been a while since I presented the theoretical part on Tuesday morning, um, but uh, don't worry, I will not repeat everything I said there. Uh, anyway, before we get our hands dirty, I would like to get to know a bit better who's in the room. So it would be awesome if you could have a look at the participant survey. It's just five really short questions because I want to know uh, if you have uh, done some work with movement before or if you're really new to the topic and uh, if you have done work before, like what kind of data you're, in, uh, you're into and what kind of analysis. And also, of course, it's uh, interesting for me to know if you already have some experience with Python and if anyone did bring a sample of their data for later in the workshop, we probably will have some extra time in the end. Uh, we can also have a look at that if that's the case. So if you could just let me know a bit of about yourself. It, I've published it in the Mattermost channel. So you can just click it on there and in the Tuesday session we had a pretty even split of people who had and who had not yet worked with movement data. And now we have nine more people, potentially, in the Python channel. Python questions. In the meantime, maybe just a quick uh, wrap up of what I uh, explained already on Tuesday in the morning a little. Um, this library is an extension of pandas and geopandas. So there is a lot of stuff that I'm building on here, but uh, really uh, the essential thing that Moving Pandas provides is a class called Trajectory, which can be used to conveniently interact with your movement data. And the structure of this workshop will be uh, three notebooks that I have prepared. The first one really is an introduction to this Trajectory class, so you see from the very basics how you can create the trajectory and we will go through a couple of the functions that it provides. And the two other notebooks that I've prepared are uh, application examples. One is uh, with ship movement data and the other one is with bird migration data. And they have pretty different characteristics and uh, we will go through those. And um, even, let's see what, your background is so far not that many responses here so most people say they either have no experience or a little experience with Python uh, that should not be a problem the notebooks are prepared uh, they should not be using any too complicated stuff in any way even if you are not planning to continue working with movement data because lots of you don't um, all the parts that are general pa introduction to Python and Pandas that you will see in these notebooks might come in very handy if you try to use Python in the future for your data analysis because they are widely applicable to all kinds of data sets. Okay, awesome. In the instructions to the workshop, I asked you to install Moving Pandas as instructed on the Moving Pandas GitHub repository. The recommended way is to use Anaconda to set up the Python environment. And there is an environment file, that's this environment YAML, which will set up all the uh, other libraries that Moving Pandas and the notebooks depend upon. In case 
that does not work for you or you haven't had the time or you just decided to take this class, um, that's not a problem at all. You don't need to go through the hassle of installing it right now because it takes a while in my experience. I've also prepared the notebooks in a way so that they run on my binder. So if you uh, click on this uh, badge, on the launch and binder patch, uh, it will also start a notebook, uh, the notebooks for you. It will take a while, but I've uh, already built it once today, so consecutive builds usually don't take that long. Um, so this one should eventually also show you the same thing as if you're running the notebooks locally. Uh, you, if you run them locally, you have to navigate, of course, to, your, um, to the directory where you downloaded Moving Pandas and then you should see those free notebooks as well. So do we have people who will be using the MyBinder? Then I'll wait for you for everything to have started up. Okay, just let me know when it's, when it's done. So mine just finished loading. So it's definitely done in a rather short time. You ready? Everyone else okay? You're on the way, okay. The first notebook starts with some more uh, a really short uh, theoretical um, discussion that also ties in with what I said on Tuesday that there is this dual perspective that you can have of trajectories. You can view a trajectory as a, a sequence of points as well as a, as a sequence of line segments. And both of these views can be useful for, for different purposes. Obviously, when we collect data with a GPS tracker, the raw data will be points with timestamps. But for many of the analysis that we then do on top of the data sets, it's way more uh, useful to think of the trajectory as a series of line segments. Like you can see in this example, of course you can also do an intersection between the set of points and an area that might represent a land use class or something similar. But if you do a length or a duration computation here, the results will be different than the results you will get if you look at the trajectory as a s sequence of line strings. Similarly, if you happen to have no observations in here because you have a long sampling interval, you might completely miss that this object probably moved through this land use area. So in contrast, if you have a line string, it's much uh, easier to spot such issues. And that's also why the trajectory in moving pandas uh, can access its own uh, data in both ways. So there can, it can be seen as a point geodata frame as well as a line geodata frame. And GeoPandas is very flexible in that way. You can put any geometries in uh, the column of the data frame. You can also have multiple columns, I think. Okay, with this introduction and if everyone's notebooks uh, are up and running, uh, I think we can get started. Uh, the first few two blocks in the notebook really just set up our environment. So there is a couple of libraries here. Of course, there's pandas and moving pandas. Then Contextily is a bit more exotic. Contextily provides uh, background maps that we will be seeing later on. Then there is GeoPandas, which has, amongst other things, this really nice read file function, which enables us to read from ver a wide variety of geospatial data formats. Of course, it uses uh, GDAL in the background. And then there is Shapely for the geometries, DateTime and Matplotlib for the plotting. With that set up, um, the next couple of uh, blocks will show you how to create a trajectory from scratch. 
this is uh, really to um, introduce you to how the trajectory looks like. Obviously, if you are working with your own data set and you read it in from a geo package or from a shapefile or whichever format it comes in, you will not construct a trajectory in this way manually. You will just read in the file and then uh, construct the trajectories automatically. We will do that uh, soon. But this is really the bare bones minimum example which you can do if you don't have any data and you're just trying to find out what this class does. So this is really, at minimum, we need a data frame with geometries and timestamps. And then we tell the data frame that it should be indexed by the time. Um, and with this data frame, we can then create a geodata frame, a geopandas geodata frame, which just needs the additional information about the coordinate reference system. So this one here is a local one uh, from Austria, but the only important information really is that it's a metric uh, a coordinate reference system. And then given this geodata frame, we can create our trajectory. The number one here is just an ID that we give the trajectory, um, and then there is the geodata frame. And with that, we are all set up. We have a small trajectory. We can uh, output some information about the trajectory by just uh, calling the print method on it. And this will summarize the information in the trajectory for us. So when did it start? When did it end? How many positions does it have? The overall length and the bounding box, as well as the line string in WKT format. The size is the number of points that the trajectory consists of. So since we have four points, um, that's the number it returns here. Also what you can see here in the uh, next block is that uh, the trajectory has a data frame. So we are using composition here. Um, the other library that I mentioned on Tuesday uh, at the end of my presentation, uh, Scikit Mobility, uh, they decided to uh, inherit from the, uh, from the data frame. So this is a, a design decision that I made. In this case, the trajectory has a data frame and this is how you can look at it and manipulate it if you want to. Of course, with this tiny example, it's easy to imagine how the trajectory looks like, but if you have a serious real-time, a real-world data set, you, want to, you have to map your trajectory. So there is multiple ways of getting a picture of your trajectory. One of the nice things in these notebooks that I found in Jupyter particularly is that it will automatically plot any shapely geometry objects that are returned within a block. So the trajectory to line string function returns a shapely line string and uh, the notebook can draw it without us doing anything extra. We don't need to do any extra work and it outputs these graphics. Of course, it's only semi-useful because it lacks the geographic context. There are no uh, labels for the x and y axis, but at least you can have a, a, a first picture of the, what the trajectory and the movement looks like. If you want a bit more context, for example, if you want to know the speed of movement, there are convenience functions for that, of course. So the trajectory has an add speed function, which adds an additional column, which computes the speed between consecutive uh, points. So this speed uh, will usually be computed in the units of this uh, coordinate reference system per second. So in this case, it's meters per second. If it's a coordinate system which is, uses miles, then it will be miles per second. Um, if the only exception is if it's in geographic coordinates. If the coordinate system is uh, EPSG 4326, then it will do spherical distance computations and will also return meters per second instead of degrees per second. Mm -hmm. 
in case of geographic coordinates, we do um, spherical distance calculations. That's fixed, of course. You can use now an, any other pandas function to calculate yet another column, which would be kilometers per hour or anything else. But the add speed function uh, always returns unit of coordinate reference system per second. So this actually alters the data frame of the trajectory by adding another column. Now we can use the speed to, to visualize it. So we can plot the trajectory with the speed information. And uh, this is not now done using the trajectory.plot uh, uh, function. And this function, you can provide any column. So if we had some extra, we could use others as well. But of course, we can use the speed to um, color the corresponding line segments according to the speed values. And we can add a legend uh, as well. This is a standard matplotlib syntax. Also, GeoPandas supports plotting in the exactly same way because I'm mimicking the functionality here. So here, in contrast to the first example where the notebook draws the whole uh, trajectory as a single line string in one color. Uh, the plot function that's implemented here draws each segment individually and thus can color it according to the speed values. What other functions do we have? In general, whenever you're working with a Python library that you're not familiar with, you can always call the DRR, dir function on any class and it will list you all the functions that are available for this class. Um, the one with the double underscores in the be beginning usually shouldn't be called directly, but if you scroll down, you will get to all the functions that are without underscores, and those are the ones which are fair game, so you can use them uh, to, to work with the class. And obviously here you just get the function names, uh, but if you want more information about an individual function, you would call the, the help function on it. So for example, the help of moving pandas trajectory get position at tells us that this function returns a shapely point at the given date time. So in this way, you can interact with the doc strings that the developers have provided in the library that you're using. MP trajectory, MP is the library, trajectory is the class. That's not the object, that's just the, the class definition. Okay. But you could also call it on the toy trajectories. So, um, help toy trajectory also works. So you can call it on the class or on the object, it's fine either way it will always give you the documentation. So this uh, get position at function, uh, you provided a timestamp and it gives you the point at this time. Uh, here's an example for asking for the point, for the position at, on the 1st of January 2018, 12.06. And what's interesting with get position and related functions is that you need you can specify a method of how exactly it's supposed to uh, determine this point. So here it uses the the nearest method, um, but there's also a couple of other ones which I will show you. Of course, here we have the same effect that we have before, since it returns a shapely geometry. By default, the notebook will just plot the point without any contextual information. If you want to see the coordinates of the point, you can call, for example, the print function on it, and it will output the WKT representation of the point where you can actually see the coordinates. And now we see that uh, at 12.06, it says the location of the moving object was at uh, 6, 0 which already was an existing row. So we already knew that at 12.06 this uh, object was at this location. 
It gets more interesting if you are querying for a time which is not already in the input data. So if we look, for example, one minute later at 12.07, it's less clear what should be the answer of the, that the function returns. And that's why the where the method comes in. So if you provide method nearest, it will look which of the points was closest in time and will return that one. So it will return the same answers as it did one minute before. It will say it's uh, six zero. Another option that makes sense is to d use interpolated. And interpolated is also the default. So it will look at the previous record and at the following record and it will do a linear interpolation between the two and will uh, try to estimate the location. So here it uh, returns 6 and 1.5. And then there are two other methods which are standard if you work with um, pandas data frames. They are forward fill and backward fill, which just means that it always takes the, rec the row before the timestamp or always the row, uh, record that follows the timestamp. So either zero, uh, 6, 0 or 6, 6. Okay. Yeah, um, so there is what I could edit in the doc string. I haven't decided yet if I want to edit to the doc string. Um, but you have one thing that happens if you use an unsupported method, it will tell you that it has to be one of those four. It says that the method that I have specified here, xx, is invalid and it must be one of nearest interpolated forward fill or backward fill. Yeah, that probably has to be uh, from the documentation. So I have not specif specified that yet forward fill and backward fill are st just the standard what that Pandas does anyway. And I would have to document somewhere how exactly interpolated works. But that's pro still a work to do. Probably for now, for the first release, it would make sense to put it in the doc string. So that's, that's the string that is returned here. Right, <laughs> and that, that's that's a that's a valuable perspective, of course. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that was a very uh, simple function. Of course, there's also functions that uh, return you uh, a segment of the trajectory and not just a point. So, if you specify uh, two date times, you can. Uh, extract a segment from the trajectory which starts at this point in time and ends at this point in time. And again here, the same methods can be applied. So by default, it does interpolate the positions. Um, otherwise, you could specify that it should take the nearest points only or the forward fill, backward fill. So here, you, we extract a short segment with just two points from the existing trajectory. Similarly, you can also do a clipping in space. So this would be a small example of how you could create a polygon to define an area of interest that you then use for clipping the trajectory. And the, the function is just trajectory.clip and you provide it with this polygon. And clipping returns you a list of all the segments that go through the, uh, through the uh, provided geometry, through the provided uh, polygon. Because one trajectory can, of course, traverse the polygon multiple times. So you just have to be careful when you deal with the return value. Here we print intersection at index zero, so that's the first and only intersection in this case but there could be multiple ones. So what clip returns is a list of trajectories. 
And since this is a list of trajectories, we can then do all the other, um, call all the other functions that we previously uh, executed on the original trajectory as well, of course. Okay, these are the, the basics that uh, you need to understand how this uh, trajectory class works. Um, obviously, as I mentioned in the beginning, you usually do not construct a trajectory manually by typing in all those uh, geometry coordinates and the timestamps. But instead, you will have a comma-separated value file or a shape file or some other spatial format that your data comes in. In the following examples, I'll be using geo packages. Just because they're much nicer than shapefiles, everything is in one uh, package and you don't have to worry that people are not, uh, not copying everything that they need. So really here, this first block just downloads uh, the data for you from this uh, GeoLive uh, data set, which is a human movement in Beijing. Um, and I've only m extracted a small sample now for, for this uh, tutorial. The following blocks are first reading uh, the geo package. So there's read file, which is a function of GeoPandas. Uh, then the same as we already did before, um, we need to, to set the index on the time. Um, in case the geo package uh, does not have a time column, but maybe it just stores the, the timestamp as a string, there is a convenience function in Pandas which can parse strings to date times. This, is, this one is used here. Uh, and then we can set the time index. On Friday, before coming here, I noticed that there's something wonky with the time zone support still. So here I'm calling, uh, here I'm removing all the uh, um, time zone information because it just wouldn't work. Otherwise, I hope to resolve this issue in the near future. So everything up to here is uh, basic uh, geopandas. And uh, the following couple of lines is constructing the trajectories. So we now have a data frame which co contains positions from multiple different objects. Um, the objects can be distinguished by trajectory ID. So that's why we group by the trajectory ID. And on each of those groups, we then construct a trajectory. And that's what then output it here so we can get a first understanding of the data. There are five trajectories in this data set and they range from around 460 points uh, to almost 2,000 points in a single trajectory. If we want to visualize them, we of course have access again to the plotting function. So here we can call the, the, func the plot function on each of the five trajectories that we have in the data set. And you can also see, uh, get a better feeling of the speed of, of plotting trajectories with a couple of hundred points. Excellent catch, yes. So um, th if you call plot column speed and there is no speed column in the data frame, it will automatically calculate it for you. That's just a convenience, which I thought might be nice to add. Otherwise, you can always first call the add speed function, then it adds a column speed to the data frame, which is also permanent. Um, but just for convenience, plotting realizes that it has to compute the speed before it can show it. No, it will not be updated automatically. So if you run add speed and then you remove some records, then it will not update it automatically. Yes, if you 
of course, you have to be aware of that the speed will um, go down most likely because you simplified the geometry and the time stays same, so the speed goes down. Um, that's why I wouldn't do it automatically because there should be probably some more intelligent way of averaging this, the speeds or you might want some other handling than, than just rerunning it automatically on top of your data. Of course, uh, I already mentioned that there is this, that we have added the contextually library at the top. And with contextually, we can actually add a base map to our plot as well. So the only difference between those two calls is that here you need to add with base map true. In the background, what happens is that the data is reprojected to a web mercator and it is plotted on top of the base map. So really the only thing you have to keep in mind is that here it plots in latitude, longitude, and here all the coordinates, as you can see on the axis labels, they are in web mercator now. This can take considerably longer to plot because it has to fetch the, the tiles for the background map for you. Versus the other one is just running locally, so this is the first version without the base map is considerably faster. The next example is uh, finding all the intersections of our set of trajectories with an area of interest polygon. Uh, so uh, again, I'm constructing a rectangle here, and then uh, we are looping through all the trajectories, and for each of them, we are running the clip function to get all the intersections with this polygon. And then we just apply, append it to the result list. And in this example, the result list then contains three intersections. So it's just a small example with four loops in Python. And the, the resulting list then contains, can again be visualized. Is that okay, or can I? Okay. On which block? The plotting with the base map? You probably skipped one block, uh, yes. If trajectories is not defined, then you probably did not run this block where it creates the trajectories from the data frame. Because here it creates trajectories. Mm -hmm. how, how do you run this plot again? Sorry. When, when, you when you change something on the screen, you can see the plot changing and so on. Uh, why you run it this way? Uh, to run the block, you can either press uh, this button or shift enter. Shift enter executes the block and continues to the next one. No problem. Okay, so we know how to load trajectory data from files. We know how to uh, restrict it to a certain time period that we are interested in by using the get segment between. We also know how to restrict it spatially by running the clip function. Uh, there's also some other housekeeping things that you quite regularly have to do with trajectories. For example, if you observe an object for an extended period of time, you get a really long, seemingly continuous observation of the whole thing. But quite often, you will have either gaps in your observation like if you are monitoring a person using a smartphone app, you will have gaps if 
they turn off the phone, if they stop the app, if they go underground because they have no GPS signal. So there will be many reasons why you are lacking observations. And in that case, you probably don't want to assume that it's one continuous trajectory, but you want to split it into actual observed uh, parts. So um, one function that I have implemented is called a split by observation gap. And split by observation gap takes one argument which defines how long this gap uh, if there's a time difference between consecutive points that is longer than this gap, then the trajectory is split. So in this example, the trajectory one, if there's a gap that is longer than five minutes, then please split it for me. If I do that, uh, we get three segments from the original trajectory. So... We can look at the uh, segments individually and then we will see that it has split the beginning and the end off from the middle part of the trajectory because the first uh, segment ended at 7.17 uh, and then there was a gap until 7.29. So there was uh, 12 minutes between observations, and that's longer than five minutes, so it was split, and the same thing in the end again. So that's one way of ensuring that the data that you are looking at in one trajectory does not have two big gaps. That will depend a lot on the use case and on the analysis that you are trying to run, of course. Yeah, so if you, you can write here seconds is five, then it would split after five seconds gap. You could specify day equals five. So really the time delta here is super flexible. You can use whatever you want. Another thing that's already implemented is uh, generalizing trajectories. So in this small example, we already have trajectories with more than uh, a thousand points. And for many use cases, you might be completely fine with having fewer points. And I have currently implemented two uh, generalization functions. Um, the one is uh, purely geometric. It's the classical uh, Douglas Parker um, method of generalizing. So you give it a spatial tolerance in the same units as the coordinate system of your uh, input data. And uh, you can try and run uh, it with different tolerance settings and observe the, the results uh, on the output trajectory. And of course, also on the resulting length of the trajectory, which is also impacted significantly by the generalization. But was it actually changing the tolerance? Like, did, if I change the tolerance in the numbers, like, what does it say there? Except for the uh, color, but then it says when it's something maybe with the speed? I don't know. Um, it has considerably fewer points after you generalize it. So the, the geometry of the trajectory changes because are you familiar with the Douglas Parker simplification algorithm for lines? Uh, it tries to remove points um, and it measures how big uh, deviation uh, from the new geometry that you get. And this, this tolerance value is the maximum allowed uh, uh, deviation after uh, so it can determine which points it has to keep. If you set it really high, it will basically just connect the start and the end of the trajectory. Yes, please. No, no, it does not. Uh, the speed here is um, recomputed because it's not... 
uh, available in the, uh, in the uh, data frame. So every time we call plot on a trajectory which does not have a speed column, then it recomputes the speed. But if we would do the add speed computations beforehand, then it would not update the existing column. That's the current logic that it has. So the second generalization method that is implemented is time-based instead of geometry-based. So it's more like a resampling, downsampling of the trajectory information. And in that case, the tolerance that you have to provide is the minimum time delta, so the minimum time that has to expire between consecutive points. And everything that is uh, in between is removed. So in this example, we are only keeping one point every three minutes. And as mentioned before, the time delta can also be specified in other units than minutes. So you can also write here seconds is 30 and it will do the resampling. In the resulting data frame, you can see what's actually going on. So the, the time generalized data frame. Uh, here in the sequence, you see how many points have been eliminated between uh, the remaining rows, because in the original trajectory, there, it's a consecutive, uh, consecutively increasing sequence, versus here, it has already deleted 30 points between the first and the second position. Okay. These were really the basics, and um, if everything's clear so far, we can go ahead now to the real world data sets and see what we can do with those and uh, what kind of analysis workflows I'm envisioning, and maybe we can you can share a bit if you have ideas of other things that might be interesting to ask of the data. Uh, the first hands-on example, as I mentioned, is using ship data. It has been published by the Danish Maritime Authority, and I've extracted a small area uh, around Gothenburg for the 5th of July 2017, so it's just one day of data. Uh, again, we are importing all the same libraries that we had uh, in the previous notebook. Um, this is Gothenburg. It has a really interesting coastline. There's a lot of small islands in front of the city. To load the data, we again use a read file. You can see the data set contains almost 85,000 rows, so that's Already quite a nice data set. Uh, if we look at it, the columns that are available are timestamp. The next one is the object identifier called MMSI. Then there is some status information of the ship. So here we have some underway using engine, but it also could be anchored or moored or any of uh, a specified list of available status messages. Then there is the reported speed in the speed over ground column. There's also a course over ground column, uh, a name of the ship and the ship type, as well as the geometry. We can use basic GeoPandas plot function to have a first look at the data. It's a lot of points. If we want to set our time index on the data. Uh, something that's uh, handy to know is that the parser, of course, can be uh, provided with the f information of the uh, timestamp format, because here we don't have a nice ISO timestamp. We have to tell pandas exactly what the format of our timestamps is in, so it's day, month, year, and not year, month, day, as it should be. And when that's parsed, we can set the index. Um, 
also we can do some non-spatial data exploration. This is basic uh, pandas functionality. Uh, so you can use it for all kinds of data sets that you're interested in. Here I'm plotting the histogram of the speed over ground. And what we can see is that a lot of the records have a really low speed, basically a speed of zero. That means the ships are standing still. And if we do movement data analysis, we are not really so much interested into things standing still. So the next block will remove all the records that have a speed uh, over ground that is zero. So this is basically how you do the filtering. You say you want the data frame to only be the records from the data frame that, are, that have a speed over zero. And with this, we can reduce from uh, 85,000 rows down to 33, 34,000 rows. This gives us a bit more, a uh, bit better distribution, even though there's really still a lot of uh, records with low speed here. Similarly, we can also do bar plots, for example, to explore which types of vessels we are dealing with. There's a lot of passenger vessels here. These are all the ferries that go between the mainland and the islands, and they produce a lot of records. Then we have some high-speed craft, we have some tankers, we have some cargo. So with this information, we know a little bit about how our data looks like and what it contains. Uh, we can create our trajectories now. Um, compared to the previous example in the Getting Started notebook, there is one addition here, and that is I've introduced a minimum length parameter where I say if a trajectory is not at least 100 meters long, I'm not really interested in it. Otherwise, uh, it's a lot of the same as we had before. This time we group by the MMSI because this is the name of the identifier in our data set. There is one check that ensures that there's at least two points because otherwise we won't get a trajectory out of it. And then we construct the trajectory and check its length because if it's too short, then we also discard it. And finally, we append it to the list of trajectories. Furthermore, I've created a second list with generalized trajectories for comparisons in performance between using those two. So really, uh, that it wouldn't be necessary to make yet another list of gener uh, with generalized trajectories. And if you execute that, it takes a while, uh, 47 uh, seconds in the last time I run it, and it creates 77 trajectories. And this trajectory is append, that means that uh, they come like, all together, or what do you mean the, the function, what's the name? Uh, append is a function of the Python list. So before the for, for loop, we create an empty list of uh, and then we just add the trajectories to this list. Okay. In the previous notebook, we, had, we were always plotting individual trajectories. Of course, it can also be very interesting to plot all the trajectories in one um, plot. That's why I've created this convenience function here, which is called uh, plot vessel trajectories, and it gets a list of trajectories, which it all puts onto the same plot. It also does some other neat things, uh, like it draws the trajectories in a color that depends on the ship type. So before, in the exploration step, we determined that the four most common ship types are passenger, high-speed craft, tanker, and cargo. So here we create a Python dictionary that maps from the ship type to the color that we want the trajectory to draw in. And we also define a default color. So if a, the sh a trajectory is from a different ship type than one of those four, then it should just be gray. And then what this function does it, it is it loops through the list of trajectories. And for each of the trajectories, it checks the ship type. Uh, whether it exists in the ship type to color dictionary or not, determines the trajectory or ship color, and then it does the plotting. 
And the syntax that you see here with the X, uh, which is returned by trajectory plot, that's really how Matplotlib does plotting of multiple things onto the same axis. It returns you the axis and then you provide that return value for the next, the next time you call it. And in that way you can plot all the trajectories on top of each other. And you can see that different ship types, they do frequent different parts of the harbor. So the green ships, which are the high-speed craft, they are focused here on the southern part of our area of interest. And the red ships that are tankers, they tend to be here in the north. They tend to use these parts of the harbor, while the passenger vessels, they go all the way inland as well. Here I did some runtime investigations, so I plotted the trajectories with the original resolution first, which took 20 seconds to render, and I plotted the generalized trajectories, which was finished in six seconds time. So you can decide on the trade-off between those things. Uh, it's obviously uh, generalized and not as visually pleasing this way, but you would still get a feeling of what kind of ships are uh, appearing in which area, I assume. But this is the shortcut for taking time, so just a double uh, percentage sign and time will um, record the wall time of, that it takes to execute this block of code in a notebook. Okay. Uh, instead of just visualizing the whole trajectory with one attribute, like the ship type, we can, of course, also visualize uh, other properties, like the navigation status of the ship. Uh, so with the first trajectory in our list, the one with index zero, uh, we can see that uh, it starts out underway using engine, uh, so the head of the data frame the rows in the head of the data frame, they have underway using engine status, versus the tail of the data frame, where the trajectory ends, the status is then moored, because the ship uh, went into the harbor. So we can also plot this on top of the map, and here uh, we would specify that the column that is used is not speed, as we did previously, but it's the nav status. And, um, then the plotting function will automatically determine all the um, different values and will plot them in different colors, and we have the legend here uh, to be able to interpret the results. Also something that I haven't mentioned before is that contextually, of course, provides different base maps, so you're not bound to a specific one. They just uh, provide a certain list of uh, standard uh, definitions, which means that they already know where to look them up. Uh, but you could uh, put in any other URL for base map tiles here as well to be used as a background for your maps. You, can, you also don't have to specify the zoom level. Um, it can be determined automatically from the data. I just noticed that it automatically wants to pick zoom level 15 for this area, and for some reason these tiles are not available in zoom level 15, so I fixed it to zoom level 14. But that's just something I had to do because for some reason these tiles were not available. You can find more about this in the corresponding um, GitHub repositories and documentation, of course. Okay, let's try some analysis of this data now. For example, we might be interested in what kinds of ships do go uh, further inland. And there is one landmark that stands out particularly here in Gothenburg, and that's this one bridge that goes over the... Um, I don't know if it's already considered a river here, but anyway, it's the Elfsborgensbrand Bridge. And uh, if we see that as our area of interest, 
uh, we can specify that as a polygon, and then we can find out which trajectories intersect with uh, this bridge. So we can, for example, run trajectory to line string and then intersects the area of interest to find out that 20 of our trajectories in, in the data set do intersect with this bridge. And then we can plot, we can have a look how these uh, trajectories look like. And we can plot them with the nav status or with any of the other properties that are available in the data frame. Again, you can find out more about uh, the individual ships by, by looking at the data frame itself. This is just um, selecting based on intersection. So it's not like the clipping we did before where we actually um, manipulated the trajectory. This is just a geometric check, a true or false, does the line string of this trajectory intersect uh, with the polygon that we have specified as an area of interest. It's still the same original trajectory. Instead of just checking whether there is any kind of intersection, of course, we could be more specific. We could say that we only want trajectories that start or end within the area of interest, not just pass through. So, um, okay, I got a bit ahead of myself because uh, first what we are doing here is, uh, I mentioned before you have these continuous observations, but um, particularly if you only look at a small area that does not cover the whole um, area of movement of the objects that you're looking at, um, then you get effects like the one we see here. So if a ship leaves the area of interest and then returns in some other point and re-enters the area of interest, then you get these ugly lines connecting the point of exit and the point of re-entry. And... To get rid of those and to split the trajectories into individual parts, we can use what I introduced in the first uh, notebook and uh, split the trajectories uh, again by observation gap. So this resolves the issue of the lines that connect exit and entry points, and it actually creates us 302 individual trips out of the original 77 continuous vessel tracks. That, that's a bit of housekeeping and cleaning up. And with, with this uh, cleaning of the data set, we then have more meaningful origin and destination information that we can use to analyze our data. So the, the origins and destinations uh, can be accessed using the get start location and the get end location function of the trajectory. And we can plot the origins or destinations, of course, also individually. So what this code does is create a geodata frame of the start locations. And then it plots this geodata frame and it colors the start locations depending on ship type. And... What you can see in the map, obviously, is that there are start locations close to land. That's when a ship leaves the harbor. But there are also start locations, of course, at the entrance to the area of interest, because that's the first time that we see that object. So you can see when the speed changes from zero to something above zero, or when the ship trajectory enters the observation area. Similarly, you can also look at the speed over ground, and here you have another indicator of the same thing, right? So if the speed, the, starting sp uh, the speed of the start location is very low, it's probably just when the ship starts moving, versus when the speed is uh, rather high, it's the ship is already underway, and it just entered our area of interest. Some ships also pop up in the middle of the area for the first time, so that's either at the very beginning of our observation period, 
or just something odd going on with the data collection procedure and we just didn't see it before. So all these things can happen with real-world data sets, obviously. And the following example now is what I already got ahead with. It's how you can find chips that depart from a certain area within the harbor. So for example, if you're interested in which ships depart from the maritime administration docks, uh, you can specify the geographic extent of those uh, of the docks, and then you can check the trajectory get start location if it intersects with this area of interest. And that's the way how you can get all the trajectories that start at the maritime administration, which is down here in the south. And then we can create a list. We can uh, have a look at all the ships. And um, we will find out that there is actually two law enforcement vessels that departed uh, from the administration area, the K KBV 010 and the 048, as well as a couple of pilot vessels, which makes absolute sense because large ships in Gothenburg, they need a pilot to be allowed to come into harbor. So these pilot ships, they go back and forth between the administration and the other ships that they need to service. So they depart multiple times during the day. They're very, very busy. And of course, you can do the same for arrivals. So most of the ships that depart, they will arrive back. So you can also check if the end location is in the area of interest. And we have mostly the same vessels here that we also have in the list above, of course. And in addition, there was one tanker that also arrived there. Maybe it has to be checked or something like that. Do you have any questions so far? If not, we can leave the world of ships behind. Uh, we can go to the second practical example, which is about bird, bird migration. So the similarity is this is also a data set with GPS positions of moving objects. Uh, but in contrast to the ship data set, which only covered a very small area and only one day, uh, this bird migration data set is covering a much larger area and a much longer time. But let's have a look. Uh, the data source is uh, from MoveBank. I've put a link in here. Uh, you probably already know MoveBank. They have a ton of data, and that's really interesting to explore, even if, like... Myself, you have no idea really about bird migration, but it's still interesting to look at. So again, it's a geo package. Again, this time we can do the date-time parsing quite easily because they use a standard ISO date, date timestamp. And the data set has a similar size like the, the ship data set around 90,000 rows. <laughs> That's an excellent question, but I would have to look it up. I, I don't remember. I, I really don't know. I think the guy's name starts with a W, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... Okay. Yeah, it's, it's a great resource for all these kinds of data. Uh, so this data set contains most notably, of course, timestamp, longitude, latitude. The sensor type is always GPS as far as I've seen. Uh, then it's always the same kind of bird. It's always this uh, gull uh, species. Uh, the important other column is the individual local identifier because that's specific to the individual uh, bird. If we 
plot the geodata frame directly, we can see the wide range uh, of movement here. So it goes from the equator up to over uh, 90, uh, 60 degrees uh, latitude. Also, let's have a look how many individuals we are dealing with, and there's a really convenient function, which is the dot .unique, uh, which shows us, okay, there are quite a number of individuals in here. Uh, so they have been tracking a lot of birds. Um, let's see if they all have approximately the same data. So we can, again, create a bar chart that shows how many records per individual we have. And looking at this, it's, it's pretty clear that there is this one individual which has over 8,000 records and lots of individuals which have very few records. So either they lost the tracker or it broke very early after being deployed. Anyway, there's a couple of individuals that will be much more interesting to look at than, than the other ones. So, with that in mind, let's create some trajectories. Um, I did the same thing again. I specified a minimum length here of 100 meters. And I also prefer, uh, performed some uh, trajectory generalization. And this results in 125 trajectories. Now if we want to look at the individual with the longest trajectory, that's the one here on the left, the 91916A. I wrote this um, convenience function which uh, loops through the list of trajectories and returns the trajectory with a specific ID. So that helps me here to get the, that one individual from the list of trajectories and look at its data frame. And of course, we can plot it also with the speed. And here we can see, okay, this, this one is really traveling a lot. It's always going from somewhere in Scandinavia to the Red Sea multiple times because it has been observed over multiple years. So seeing that, my first reaction was, okay, we probably have to split that by year if we want to get to see any more details about that. So there is a function that is called split by date, and you can specify that you want to split it by year. And if you execute that on our trajectory, you get a list uh, of trajectory segments uh, divided by year. So we can see that the first trajectory for this individual is from 2009, and the last one is from 2015. So we have quite a long time of observation for this bird. Yeah. It's Web Mercator. So always uh, when you plot with base map is true, it always reprojects the data to Web Mercator. Yes, because uh, contextually can only plot in Web Mercator as far as I know, at least by default. So when we have split the trajectory into smaller parts, uh, we have a bit easier time to handle them. So we can get, um, we can pick one year, for example, 2010, and have a look at it. And really it started on the 1st of January, January and we have the last record on the 31st of December. So it really covers the whole uh, time period very well. And we have 700 uh, records in this trajectory. So a couple of precisions per day too, um, which 
probably is fine enough for this large scale um, analysis of the data set. If we plot this one year, we can see where it goes at which speed. But if we want some more information, like where exactly was the individual at a certain point in time or a certain season, then we have to do, of course, more than just, just plot the trajectory as it is. Instead, um, if you remember, we had the um, get position at function, which can be specified with a timestamp and it returns a point. And I created this convenience function around it now, which is called plot location at timestamp, uh, which basically creates you the plots that you can see below. So it plots the trajectory as well as the position at the time that you specify. So we can have a look. The individual was at, in the Polish seaside in the beginning of September and in the beginning of October it had moved inland and was on its way towards the Red Sea already. Here again you can see uh, what I mentioned. Uh, if you want to add other layers to the maps, you have to know whether you're currently rendering in latitude, longitude, or in Web Mercator. So here the uh, position that's returned by get position at is in the original latitude, longitude, and to put it on the map, I had to do um, this reprojection here. I had to tell it the location has to be reprojected to Web Mercator before I can plot it on top of the same map as the trajectory. This can be a little tricky, but if you don't see your points, that's probably why. Okay, now the next question that I asked myself is whether the migration is similar every year or whether there is huge differences. Just how are those, how is this one individual bird ticking, right? So I, the following uh, functions, they make it possible to create a plot for the same day in different years. So from 2009 to 2013, where was this individual at the 1st of October? And I was really surprised by the large variety of locations that this bird is in at the beginning of autumn. Sometimes it's still in Denmark and other times it's already down in, in Egypt. So it's definitely triggered by something else than just the amount of sunlight, I would say, because that should be quite similar every year. So that last line seems to me a bit weird. Which one? The one that goes to them. That was in 2009, yeah. That's the first year of the observation. It looks like there is some data missing because there is this one straight line. Yeah, yeah. We would probably have to look at the publication that comes with the data to know if they have noted anything down here why this is missing. Because I assume it's the same tracker, so it's not, just not like the tracker broke. Maybe they had a problem receiving the data and it got lost somewhere along the way. So this individual certainly has an interesting schedule. <laughs> but it always goes to the same location on the uh, eastern coast of the Red Sea. So it's very consistent there. Just it does not really have a preferred location to spend the summer at. So because it's always going to this area at the Red Sea to, to spend the winter there, I 
thought it might also be interesting to see um, the other way around, like when does it arrive there, uh, instead of when is it where, uh, at which location is it at the same time of the year. So this is the geographic way of looking at things. If we define our Red Sea area, uh, we can determine the arrivals by clipping the trajectories to the Red Sea. Um, and we find that it arrived every year in 2009 until 2014. And because we clip the trajectory, we get a segment of the original trajectory. We can use the get start time of this segment to determine when the uh, individual enters our area of interest. And that ranges between almost Christmas in 2009 and sometimes it already arrives at the beginning of October. And of course, we can also plot that. So in addition, here you can see how you can also plot the area of interest polygon on top of the map. I'm always using really the, the same trick. I'm constructing a geodata frame, which I can then reproject because I want to plot it on the base map. Um, and then I can use the geopandas uh, plot function um, where I can specify color or any other styling things uh, to add the area to the map. And in this case, I'm also plotting all the points, all the entry points to the area of interest, but they're overlapping a lot, so you can only see the most recent one here uh, in the northern border of the area of interest. So that's how we can look at one individual. But as we saw in the beginning, there's a lot of different individuals in this data set. So we could try to find out which other birds went to the same area. So what I did first is I reduced the data set down a little. So I specify one year of interest. Um, so here, um, I say I'm interested in the year 2010. Uh, get me all the trajectories that were um, uh, that cover this year. So this is uh, so this gives already some data reduction, and then I also do the clipping with the area of interest. And this way I find out that in 2010, there are were 16 individuals that arrived in this area. Or 16 traject uh, trajectory segments. It doesn't necessarily have to be individuals uh, because as I mentioned, the clipping that can also return you multiple trajectories of the same individual. So really, if we want to know how, um, more details, we can print it out like this, for example. Um, so there's some interesting patterns there. I think, for example, some of the individuals only appear in the area for a really short time, like five days or three days, while others seem to spend the whole winter there. So they're there for uh, a couple of weeks or months even. So it stands to reason that some of the individuals just pass through while others spent, actually spent the winter there. So let's have a look. Uh, for example, there's also one individual that passes through the area twice. It's the 91761A. Uh, it passes through in April and then again in autumn. So that certainly indicates that it, it went somewhere else and this was just on its route. So what has it been up to? This individual, if we plot its trajectory, we can see that it continues much further south to the, all the way to the equator where it has its um, winter holidays in Rwanda. Yeah, yeah. That's quite an impressive trip for this bird. So it doesn't stay at the Red Sea like some of the others do. 
So, <laughs> definitely that must be a huge adventure. Um, also what we can see here is that some birds, they, this one likes to go on the western coast of the Red Sea while our previous bird always stayed on the eastern coast of the Red Sea. So there's definitely different migration paths uh, here that might be of interest to look at if you are into bird conservation or such. Um, so there is one other thing that contextually does that I thought would be interesting for you to know independent of whether you work with movement data or not. And that's the thing, uh, contextually has a really neat way of geocoding names. So, uh, for example, I have picked two cities, one on each side of the Red Sea. Uh, so I have picked Jeddah on the, west on the east coast and I've picked Port Sudan on the eastern coast of the Red Sea. Uh, and I've geocoded them. And I've written these convenience functions uh, that buffer the return points and draw them in different colors here on the map. And this is one way that you can use to uh, label trajectories based on the area that they um, traverse. Um, so really, besides just plotting it like I did here, uh, it gets really interesting if you then do... Um, Again, checks based on intersection, so you check if the trajectory intersects with the buffered place. Uh, and then you can visualize the trajectories uh, based on which of the places they pass through. And you can have a more, more context for the trajectory information as well, so we know exactly which individual was in which place at which time. Yeah, and with that, we've, we've reached the end of this uh, bird demonstration. Um, if you are into movement ecology, I would love to hear what you think about and what kind of functions you would definitely expect to see in a library that would be useful to you. Um, if you have some other movement data that you want to analyze, uh, let me know. We still have around half an hour, and we also have time for a coffee break, depending on how you want to do if you brought your own data set, I'd be happy to help you bring it into Moving Pandas. Uh, and if not, then I want to thank you for being here and for making this a really interesting and interactive session. Thank you.